thank you again, and uh, hopefully we'll find this uh, somewhat entertaining. So what I'd like to do now is to turn to some uh, aspects of molecular imaging that are uh, uh, still in the uh, uh, arena of research, uh, but which many of us think will have important impact on our understanding of, of neurologic uh, and CNS disorders, um, hopefully in the, in the near future. So the first uh, topic that I want to share with you relates to um, neuroinflammation, uh, whatever that entity is, uh, and how we can approach this through molecular imaging uh, uh, studies. So inflammation, uh, uh, conceptually, has multiple components. Uh, inflammation is associated with uh, uh, contributions from the uh, vasculature, uh, from uh, specific cells that mediate uh, the inflammatory uh, uh, cascade and response, and also from molecular mediators. And uh, when we refer to inflammation, I think we're really talking conceptually um, about a process that involves uh, at least uh, each of these elements, uh, if not uh, uh, additional. Neuroinflammation, so inflammation particularly of the central nervous system, uh, can be addressed in a number of ways and has a number of identified components. First, there is indeed a vascular contribution. Uh, the uh, blood-brain barrier, which is, uh, consists usually of tight junctions between the endothelial cells, um, becomes uh, leaky, and this permits uh, the detection of blood-brain barrier breakdown by the entry of polar compounds uh, into the brain that would have been excluded. And this is, of course, the basis of contrast enhancement in inflammatory brain lesions um, with, say, gadolinium uh, and MRI. If one measures uh, uh, blood flow, there is also an associated hyperemia with uh, the vascular aspect of, of inflammation. Although the brain has such a high blood flow rate uh, at baseline, um, often a further increase in blood flow is not readily detected. There is certainly cellular contributions to inflammation within the nervous system, and these consist of exogenous cells, largely systemically trafficking white blood cells uh, and phagocytes that are recruited uh, across the blood-brain barrier and into the brain substance um, when inflammation uh, is present. But in brain, there are also endogenous cells that become transformed and or, quote, activated um, when neuroinflammation uh, is present. And these uh, can take the uh, form of microglial cells that um, hypertrophy and enhance when stimulated or activated, but also so-called reactive changes in astrocytes in the brain uh, that are responsible for uh, changes that we refer to as gliosis. So this constitutes the spectrum of what we could look for in the brain uh, that would tell us uh, either uh, singularly or in concert about the presence of an inflammatory process. So, why would we care about identifying inflammation in the brain? Well, there are some disorders that we think are primarily an inflammatory problem. And these, of course, are infections where inflammation is the normal host response, uh, be these viral, bacterial, protozoal, etc but also a collection of disorders that are believed to be pathological activation of one or more parts of the inflammatory cascade uh, in uh, an abnormal um, and dysregulated fashion. And here, disorders including multiple sclerosis, some paraneoplastic syndromes, uh, some para-infectious uh, syndromes, such as Sydenham's chorea, and others uh, are hypothesized to arise from uh, dysregulated and inappropriate activation of uh, inflammatory responses. So these constitute disorders where um, a study of uh, inflammation markers would be key to our um, uh, ability to better characterize them. But there are also secondary inflammatory uh, changes that are associated with uh, other neuropathologies, uh, but where the inflammation may have deleterious and uh, 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 secondary changes that could in some instances outweigh the primary insult. 
So there are robust inflammatory changes accompanying, uh, accompanying ischemic stroke, um, also in response to blunt uh, and actually penetrating as well brain and head trauma. And there is great debate about the role of inflammatory responses in neurodegenerative diseases. And here, the debate actually rages on uh, both sides of the coin, uh, where many believe that uh, inflammatory changes may contribute to uh, loss of brain function in many of the degenerative symptom, uh, syndromes, uh, whereas there are others who believe that neuroinflammation is actually beneficial at removing uh, dysfunctional tissue and allowing better recovery of the remaining brain. Uh, so it could be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and for these reasons, we would like to have a more precise uh, measure uh, of the inflammatory cascade and its uh, activity and location. Uh, so just uh, as an example, for instance, of one of these, there are uh, uh, numerous examples where apparent inflammatory mechanisms may underlie or contribute to very common neurologic disorders. Uh, and this paper from uh, the early 2000s, for instance, uh, suggested and was one of the first to suggest that inflammatory activity may play a role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was a retrospective, uh, retrospective analysis, an epidemiologic study of the association between use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia. And what was found was that depending upon the model that you applied in terms of how many years after starting the regular use of non-steroidals, and in this case intended usually for the treatment of arthritis, uh, one could see a reduction in the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And that reduction uh, after uh, many years of non-steroidal use could be as much as a 50% decline in the risk of developing a dementia. So this, if true, would be a very compelling reason to consider inflammatory mechanisms at least as contributing to um, dementia. And it led to several clinical trials of whether you could prevent uh, dementia by uh, intentionally administering non-steroidals to uh, large populations of patients. Uh, those trials have uh, unfortunately had negative results. Uh, nevertheless, this is uh, the level of our lack of understanding about whether neuroinflammation is an important or an unimportant uh, component of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So. This cartoon, which I've stolen from uh, uh, a review written by Winkler in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, sort of articulates the range of uh, cellular and molecular processes that accompany neuroinflammation, at least those that we're aware of. And what I'd like to do is highlight for you um, a series of uh, molecular approaches to studying uh, uh, the neuroinflammatory condition. So the first of these I've already alluded to, blood-brain barrier disruption. So the presence of inflammation allows uh, uh, substances that are usually excluded from the brain, be they small molecules or cells, uh, to enter uh, the brain where the inflammatory reaction is present. And of course, we're good at uh, depicting this with the um, entry into the brain of um, either iodinated contrast in CT um, or a gadolinium-based contrast in MRI. We can do this with molecular PET imaging as well. If you have a gallium generator, you can make gallium-68 EDTA, a, a polar acid uh, analog, and it, like these other uh, contrast materials, enters the brain only when the blood-brain barrier um, has been disrupted. Uh, and there are, of course, other hydrophilic radio tracers used for other purposes that will enter the brain only when blood-brain barrier uh, breakdown is present. Cell migration could theoretically be studied by radio labeling cells. Uh, however, uh, we have not seen uh, uh, extensive use of, say, radio label leukocytes in uh, brain inflammatory disorders, but in theory, this as well could be done. Um, microglial activation, though, is a cellular aspect of the endogenous um, uh, inflammatory response, has a number of potential ways. Uh, that, it, that we can image, and the combination of these either exogenous white cells entering the brain or the activation of microglial cells that are um, previously quiescent result in a series of metabolic changes that can be imaged. 
Uh, and so the inflammatory cellular response, I'll show you some evidence from our laboratory in the 1980s that indicate that glycolysis measured with deoxyglucose uh, can be seen. Uh, and some newer evidence about uh, the potential role of kenurenic acid metabolism that can be traced by alpha-methylparatyrosine. So first are some studies that were done uh, in my laboratory in the uh, uh, early 1980s uh, where our interest was in looking at the um, brain metabolic response to selective neuronal damage. And, and in doing this, we're using carbon-14, 2-deoxyglucose, so the small animal autoradiography analog, if you will, of fluorodeoxyglucose. And what we did was to do specific excitotoxic lesions of one striatum in the rat uh, by the injection of, um, uh, in this case, ibotenic acid, a glutamate analog. And what we know from histology of the brain is that this agent uh, destroys uh, nerve cell bodies in the region where you inject it, but it leaves intact um, presynaptic nerve terminals from other brain regions, uh, and there's a relative astrocytic um, response uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the lesions. So we assumed that having injected the toxin into this striatum and waiting uh, a week or two, that this reduced activity was due entirely to um, damage to the nerve cells here, and that the remaining activity re represented metabolism within persistent nerve terminals from other brain regions that came into the striatum region. Um, but what we discovered inadvertently was that if you anesthetized um, one of these lesioned animals, you now reveal that the metabolic activity in the lesion striatum was not able to be suppressed. In fact, under deep barbiturate anesthesia, the uh, metabolic activity in the lesion striatum is actually higher than the normal unlesioned side. Uh, we went on to s uh, show that um, inflammatory hyperemia was present, so this is a tracer iodoanepyrene of cerebral blood flow, and you can see it's increased uh, in the subacute period after this um, experimental injury. But of even greater interest, if we switched from the use of deoxyglucose to C14 glucose, so this is a tracer now of um, uh, respiratory activity in the mitochondrion, uh, uh, what you can see is that all of the um, sugar that is entering this part of the brain is immediately lost. So with C14 glucose, you don't see this remaining activity. It's completely gone. And we deduce that this is because uh, the glucose oxidation uh, 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 that would have occurred uh, is not being supported. And that, in fact, what's happening is the glucose is being converted to lactic acid, which then immediately leaves this part of the brain. Whereas the deoxyglucose gets phosphorylated and is then trapped, just as though complete glucose oxidation is ongoing. So this disparity between uh, deoxyglucose and glucose is, um, in my experience, unique to inflammatory brain lesions, and we think tells us about metabolic activity in inflammatory cells that don't respond to anesthesia because they're not neural elements, and which uh, are converting glucose to lactic acid, which then leaves the brain readily. And what we could show as well is that not only was this true for the lesion striatum, where the uh, anesthetized case shows persistence of this metabolic activity, but if we look at the nerve terminals uh, of these cells that we've killed, which are here in the substantia nigra, you find similarly an increased metabolic activity uh, uh, under anesthesia, indicating that the degeneration of the presynaptic nerve terminals was substantial enough to drive this same uh, mechanism. And again, with carbon-14 labeled glucose, we see uh, virtually no residual metabolism here uh, and no asymmetry in the substantia nigra. So what we see is that um, 2-DG, uh, or fluorodeoxyglucose in the case of human PET scanning, is able to transduce uh, an abnormal metabolism associated with inflammatory cell infiltration. And in fact, this could be used in human clinical research if we would simply uh, be able to safely anesthetize patients and look for this component of metabolism that is not functional uh, in nature. Now, 
there is an alternative uh, uh, mechanism of identifying the presence of uh, uh, inflammatory mononuclear cells, um, which has been pioneered by uh, 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 the group at Montreal Neurologic that introduced the use of um, uh, 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 alpha-methyltryptophan as a precursor for serotonin synthesis. So the agent was uh, introduced uh, and invented, if you will, for tracing serotonin biosynthesis. But it turns out that investigators uh, at Detroit Children's Hospital have discovered that the accumulation of AMT is actually much more heavily related to inflammatory activity in the brain than to serotonin metabolism. And so this is the example of an MRI of a patient with refractory epilepsy due to tuberous sclerosis. And you can see on the MR scan there are multiple uh, tubers in this individual's brain. Uh, so at least four, for instance, in this one cut. If we do fluor deoxyglucose PET scanning, you can see that this tuber here in the medial aspect of the right hemisphere it actually shows very little uh, uh, metabolic activity. But if we inject AMT, there's actually very intense accumulation in this tuber and not in the others. These investigators have further shown that uh, it's this tuber that accumulates AMT that needs to be surgically resected to stop the epilepsy. And in fact, here's an example of a patient that underwent FDG scanning and then AMT scan. Uh, and indeed, uh, they had uh, intense accumulation in this lesion. Uh, they then went to surgery and had resection. But postoperatively, there was residual AMT uptake in the surgical bed, and the patient's seizures were not relieved. When they reoperated to remove this remaining area of uh, uh, AMT accumulation, uh, the seizures uh, stopped. So the assumption here is that in tuberous sclerosis and perhaps other neurologic conditions where inflammation is present, it's the inflammation that drives epileptic seizures. Now, how would this occur? Well, the tracer, uh, uh, alpha-methyltryptophan, uh, is, is converted normally in, into um, serotonin. But in white blood cells, uh, tryptophan is further metabolized to kenurenic acid, which is an excitotoxin, uh, and actually gives rise to the generation of quinolinate, which is a very potent glutamate analog with excitotoxic properties. But this conversion of tryptophan into quinolinic acid requires the presence of a white blood cell that doesn't belong in the normal brain. So this metabolism pathway is absent from normal brain, but in the presence of inflammation with uh, white cell uh, 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 entry into the brain, it's plausible that the epilepsy is related to stimulation of glutamate receptors, a form of excitotoxicity, if you will, that's due to the white cells uh, processing tryptophan in this epileptogenic uh, mechanism. So we believe that's probably what's going on here, and I think that AMT is a nice candidate ligand to highlight very specifically areas where there is a lot of uh, this metabolic pathway present. Let's move on to reactive astrocytes. There are molecular approaches to imaging these guys as well. Uh, the one that uh, is uh, most uh, well appreciated um, is the presence of monoamine oxidase B in astrocytes and the increased concentration of MAOB in reactive or active astrocytes. And this can be traced by the trapping of the um, radioligand carbon-11 uh, deprenyl and particularly the deuterium substituted analog uh, which has better kinetic properties and allows us to be um, uh, more accurate in quantification of MAOB enzyme activity. Now, there are a number of enzymes associated with astrocytes that could theoretically serve as the target of a neuroimaging approach, and these include specific enzymes present in um, astrocytes, including GABA transaminase and glutamine synthetase. We do not have ligands that trace these biochemical pathways at the present time. There are also glial transporters that are specific for expression on astrocytes for the reaccumulation of uh, both glutamate and GABA from the extracellular space. 
Um, but uh, as I mentioned already, the expression of monoamine oxidase B is very heavily associated with astrocytes, and it is upregulated when those astrocytes are reactive uh, uh, to a lesion. And again, we have C11 deuterodeprinil as a potential tracer. This has been illustrated nicely by the Scandia Scandinavian group of uh, Bank Langstrom, where uh, this is a patient, these are coronal images now, with refractory epilepsy due to mesial temporal sclerosis. And what you see is the well-known glucose hypometabolism in the epileptogenic hippocampal formation here compared to the contralateral normal side. And when you administer deuterodeprinil, it's possible to separate two uh, components from its biodistribution. Uh, in this case, these investigators have used a graphical analysis to do so. But there's a delivery phase, so this is proportional to cerebral blood flow. And then there's a trapping phase, that is, of the delivered activity, how avidly is the tracer retained by being converted uh, or by alkylating, in fact, the monoamine oxidase B enzyme. And what you see in the delivery phase is a defect, a reduction in the epileptogenic hippocampus that looks just like the reduction in glucose metabolism. So we think this is due to a reduction in functional um, activity. But notice that the MAOB enzyme activity and its ability to trap and retain the tracer is dramatically elevated uh, associated with the astrocytosis and um, active inflammation in that hippocampal formation. So this is really a nice striking demonstration of um, a different enzymatic approach to identifying the presence of focal inflammation uh, in a, um, a neurologic disorder that wasn't and still isn't widely appreciated to have an inflammatory uh, uh, component of its mechanism. Uh, and I think that uh, if one looks at the literature, there's good evidence that uh, neuroinflammation and its manifestations may indeed drive uh, the persistent and medically refractory epilepsy in a number of conditions and a number of patients where we don't suspect. There is yet another marker, and this is one that has uh, a, a lot of current interest in terms of um, uh, research investigation. And this is in uh, a biochemical change in the mitochondria of active and reactive inflammatory cells. Um, the marker um, is what's referred to as um, the translocator protein, or TSPO, uh, and by some investigators, the 18 kilodalton translocator protein. Um, historically, we have had a radioligand that traces the, this transporter um, by uh, virtue of its binding, and the one that you'll be able to see most about in the um, imaging literature is carbon-11 labeled PK-11195. Now, it turns out that uh, this uh, target protein uh, was originally referred to in the medical literature as the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor. Uh, it was discovered initially um, as a low-affinity valium or diazepam binding site expressed very heavily in the kidney, uh, and found at very low levels, maybe even virtually absent in the brain. Uh, and this is the original publication I can find to the uh, nature of this um, binding site. It's expressed, as I said, very, uh, to very high degree in the normal kidney, in the spleen, and in white blood cells. It interacts at very high, uh, at high affinity with Valium and uh, with flunitrazepam, uh, another benzodiazepine, uh, but at least in the laboratory, clonazepam, yet another uh, Valium analog, does not bind to this site. So it's distinct from typical benzodiazepine recognition sites that we've come to know associated with GABA um, receptor complexes. So this used to be called the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor because it was present in kidney and spleen to very high degree. Now it's referred to as the mitochondrial uh, TSPO. And why is that? Well, we know now that its localization on a subcellular level is to the um, mitochondrial outer membrane. It has nothing to do with GABA receptors where we traditionally think of the pharmacological effects of benzodiazepines in the brain. Its biochemical function is partly in steroid um, uh, hormone uh, biosynthesis, where it transports cholesterol from the cell cytoplasm into the mitochondrion, um, where transesterification can occur. 
It uh, may be involved in the regulation of apoptosis when cells are uh, uh, undergoing uh, response to a lethal uh, uh, insult. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, theoretical evidence, at least, that it may relate to immunomodulation uh, of mitochondrial function uh, in uh, uh, inflammatory cells. When the presence of this protein was um, first appreciated, uh, there was a search for specific radioligands that would identify it, not the other benzodiazepine binding sites of more traditional origin. And the first um, ligand that was identified here was a, a, a Roche compound, RO5-4864, uh, uh, and then an isoquinoline, <clears throat> PK11195. <clears throat> Excuse me. In our laboratories, we pursued uh, the Roche compound to see whether we could image uh, <clears throat> inflammatory brain lesions, and specifically um, astrocytoma, because there's a very high expression of this protein site uh, on astrocyte-derived um, uh, neoplastic cell lines. And this is just a little molecular um, picture now where we understand that this binding site is actually part of a complex that spans the outer mitochondrial membrane. These are those two ligands. So this is the Roche compound, um, a benzodiazepine, uh, and this is the uh, uh, isoquinoline PK11195. So I believe this is one of the first reports of the use of these agents um, in imaging of uh, glioma in humans. And what we found was, so here's a patient with a high-grade glioma of their um, uh, right cerebral, or sorry, left cerebral hemisphere. And uh, RO5864 um, uh, 54, um, although initially delivered to the lesion, it was not retained. It did not bind. And this is not what we would have expected. And in fact, removing the tumor from this patient, it in fact did express high levels of um, uh, the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor, but it did not show binding of uh, the RO5-4864. Um, so uh, the flunitrazepam binding was present, but not to this ligand. In another patient with a midline uh, butterfly glioma, um, we administered carbon-11 PK11195 and found that there was uh, uh, delivery of the agent to the tumor, but intense retention. So this is an example of a, um, <clears throat> a species-dependent uh, phenotype uh, distinction where this ligand, which works in rodents uh, with um, brain tumors, does not work in man. This that works in rodents also works in man, and so it was identified that PK11195 was the prototypical imaging ligand to use for the TSPO. Now, in our laboratory, we pursued this um, with uh, studies of Alzheimer's disease as a representative neurodegeneration to see if we could identify uh, evidence for inflammatory um, activity um, in uh, uh, dementia. And uh, th these uh, represent uh, relative binding estimates in a control population of seven uh, elderly individuals compared to eight patients with moderately severe Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and what we found was no evidence for increased binding. And here are some representative images. So you can see already uh, that uh, the normal appearance of PK binding is not very impressive. This is the pituitary gland where the blood-brain barrier is deficient, but here in brain, there's very little uh, activity, and these images are quite statistically unsatisfactory. Here's an FDG um, brain PET scan showing hypometabolism in the parietal uh, cortex bilaterally, and no detectable um, increased binding to match this distribution in this same patient. So we concluded that there wasn't evidence of <clears throat> neuroinflammation with PK in Alzheimer's disease. Now, uh, fast forward to 10 years later, um, the research group at uh, 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 the uh, uh, Phil in the UK, so the Hammersmith group, uh, revisited this 
And what they discovered, or what they found, first of all, is that PK11195 is uh, a uh, uh, has racemic uh, stereo enantiomers, and only one of the two uh, uh, isomers uh, has affinity for the protein. So they used racemically resolved PK. This doubles the signal. And they employed a very sophisticated way of analyzing the biodistribution. So instead of simply imaging retention, they imaged uh, the uh, volume of distribution of the tracer um, based on a very sophisticated uh, 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 time series or principal component analysis approach. And they concluded uh, in their studies that in Alzheimer's disease there was evidence of increased tracer retention compared to a normal control, uh, and that if you looked at it, you could even perhaps imagine that in the temporal lobe, where we know there's an intense neurodegeneration in uh, early Alzheimer's disease, that there might have been um, uh, even increased uh, 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 inflammatory marker compared to rest of the cerebral cortex. So here's an example of what they found in Alzheimer's disease with a lot of temporal lobe uh, in increased retention. And here, in a patient with mild cognitive impairment, they argued that this inflammation may be present even earlier than the onset of dementia. Now, unfortunately, these results have not been able to be reproduced, and partly, I think, because the signal is very weak, but also partly because the mathematical processing it takes to get these images is very difficult to accomplish and, and requires a lot of uh, careful kinetic supervision. Others, though, have uh, pursued this same uh, approach with PK. Uh, here's an example from a, a paper of Akello and his colleagues um, that is asking the question, is there inflammation associated with the deposition of amyloid in uh, Alzheimer's disease? So here's a carbon-11 PIB scan showing increased deposition here in the frontal lobe. But in this individual, here's the distribution of PK binding, and there's no such accentuation. So from this patient, you would conclude, no, the amyloid is not inducing an inflammatory response, and that's not part necessarily of how um, the Alzheimer's lesion evolves. On the other hand, though, here's a, another patient with Alzheimer's disease, again with increased um, amyloid deposition on a PIB scan. And in this case, they argue there is uh, focal and uh, as well diffuse increase accumulation of PK, suggesting that in this patient there may be a contribution of inflammatory uh, cellular infiltration. There are other papers that relate to the same uh, comparison, and we would say that in general there's no consensus on this with the use of PK11195. But a very important aspect, I think, of understanding uh, the neurodegenerative cascade. Um, uh, here's, uh, here are some images from another study that suggests positivity um, where uh, with uh, PK11195 there may be some increased binding in this Alzheimer patient with increased PIB compared to this control individual, but this distinction is very subtle at best. There are other reports of increased PK binding in the human brain. Uh, if, for example, uh, inflammatory association with lesions in multiple sclerosis, which would be a very logical application. And uh, these kinds of uh, tracer studies might permit us to better understand the evolution of multiple sclerosis lesions if indeed we could image the uh, uh, cellular inflammatory activity. Uh, there's also a report of increased binding in frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and one that suggests increased binding in schizophrenia. But there are problems with PK uh, that uh, cause it to be a rather difficult to use radioligand and, and why I think it has not uh, been more widely adopted. One of these is that, of course, it is metabolized in vivo. Uh, this pathway of metabolism immediately releases carbon-11 formaldehyde, which I am certain is excluded from the brain probably ends up in the liver and is ultimately converted to CO2. But this pathway um, of metabolism ends up with a fragment here uh, that may penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And so what we're imaging in some of these patients, particularly in that intermediate time point between initial injection and late imaging, may include a component of a, a radio-labeled uh, uh, entity which has nothing to do with TSPO binding. <clears throat> 
Um, and in fact, uh, these investigators have shown that there are uh, some metabolites here uh, that migrate uh, on reverse phase uh, chromatography uh, in a very lipophilic position similar to authentic PK. So this ligand has some serious limitations. First, there are isomers. Only the R is active, but this can be racemically um, uh, isolated uh, from a precursor pool uh, before radio labeling. Unfortunately, even the R isomer has very limited CNS availability. Its blood-brain barrier permeability is very poor, despite that it's lipophilic. So we think it probably is binding to plasma lipoproteins and maybe even uh, blood cellular elements limiting its access to the brain. It has very poor specific to background activity uh, in uh, normal individuals as well as in many CNS conditions that we know have increased uh, inflammatory cells based on pathology. The peripheral metabolism may be contributing to background. We don't know whether the metabolites enter the brain and to what extent they reflect uh, what we're imaging. And then as I illustrated, some investigators are able to make this ligand work, uh, but it's a very complex modeling approach that must be used with this cluster analysis of principal components uh, to define a reference region. So to summarize, there are a number of approaches to the imaging of neuroinflammation uh, that we have available already. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this is an area that we'll see very aggressive uh, investigation over the um, uh, immediate short term and uh, where the possibility is that ligands for these uh, processes may enter uh, clinical uh, diagnostic practice uh, within some short time, I believe. So I'll stop.